And we're, there we go. <clears throat> so um, a bit of false advertisement. <laughs> I don't really work on post-racial um, uh, America. Uh, I, I am working on a book that uh, deals with ghosts, so there is an overlap here, and I am working on Get Out in a chapter that is mostly about possession. So we have a lot of overlap, but some differences here in terms of the things that I'm interested in here. And possession, of course, sort of ties into the history of uh, colonialism, slavery, but, but ob obviously the, sort of the concept of property here is important to me and Get Out sort of nicely illustrates that for, for me, um, at least at the beginning of this chapter, of which I want to tie in um, media ghost effects here to this notion of what who owns what, right? And it's not just bodies, but it's also images and, uh, and, and, and media itself. Whether celluloid, analog, or digital, film works like an absorbent service, surface. Once recorded by electrochemical or electrical sensors, the filmed image becomes malleable material to be replayed, copied, altered, branded, sold, and circulated independently of material conditions in which the images were originally captured. However, the moving image, and here I'm going to butcher your colleague's name, Pasi Vallejo, <laughs> argues, causes the coming into being of something that cannot be separated from its effects, nor can it be divorced from particular mediating technique from which it emanates. This something that emerges in the form of a cinematic image is therefore not equivalent to the subject absorbed on the film stock, nor any intentions of those who initiated and facilitated the rendering of that image. It takes on a life of its own. No matter how precisely we plan to execute our vision by setting the scene, framing, registering images, rehearsing actors, and editing out any perceived defects, unintended events, ghost effects, still manage to seep in. <clears throat> when these phantasmatic eruptions emerge, they claim a portion of the film space, a share of the process of meaning making, and therefore, command the spectator's attention. Even if they are simply byproducts of audiovisual productions, these apparitions illuminate a complex set of possessive practices endemic to filmmaking. To film, to be filmed, to and to watch a film is to extend the power of possession beyond the traditional subject-object relations constitute, constituted in the act of looking. Mediated forms of possession afford us the ability to seize upon or be seized by someone else's likeness, to become obsessed or enthralled by images, to the point at which we are immersed in their world, or to recoil in terror as we see our likenesses parade like gray ghosts before us on screen, reminding us that they are often beyond our control. Simultaneously passive and aggressive, Possession is often described as the practice of taking for oneself what might have been in the commons or what might belong to someone else in title or in principle. It implies an uneven distribution of things that belong to someone but not others, like property, rights, privileges, willpower, and self-autonomy. These asymmetrical distributions Divide those who possess property rights or power from those who are possessed by such property rights or dispossessed of them. What ensues from such relations is a structure of complex, co complexly entangled oppositions, the private and the public, the owner and the owned, the entitled and the exploited body and soul. By definition, however, possession confuses the subject with its object. Do we possess things, ideas, feelings, our own spirits, or do they possess us? Given its transitory nature, however, the concept of possession creates a series of cracks in the logic of property because it introduces the intangible, a holding without title, a seizure without rights, trespassing or occupying the space of an absent other, theft and exploitation. 
Yet, with respect to property law, possession usually affirms one's right to the thing at hand. After all, possession is still considered nine-tenths of the law. Given the weight of such legal discourse, what do we make of spirit possession that may also be seen as proprietary claim, the settling of debt of the living with the past, a pact with the devil, an intangible trespass on another's domain, haunting the seizing of someone else's soul, will, or body? A process of reckoning and retribution where possession responds to appropriation, to exploitation, to imperialism, to settler colonialism. Acts of possession have generated legions of ghosts in the long entangled histories of juridical disputation over what constitutes a self, a person, or a thing, what is physical and incorporeal, wicked and virtuous, what is there for the taking and what belongs in the public domain. Accordingly, the law has never shied away from passing judgment on heretics, witches, the value of haunted houses, trespassers of all sorts, who is entitled to standing under the law, who is entitled to an inheritance, to cultural heritage, to the remains of the dead, and reparations. The law is thus embroiled in the, in the politics of ghosts. Jordan Peele's Get Out, and I know you've just seen this film, but I'll, I'll just play it in the background as I, um, and hopefully it's silent, as I talk on. It provides us with an astute example of the complicated etymology of the word possession, and that's meaning hinges on so many acts of dispossession, deprivation, loss, psychic manipulation, body snatching, and subliminal messaging. In Get Out, the protagonist, Chris Washington, accompanies his white girlfriend, Rose Armitage, to a visit to her parents in the wealthy upstate New York uh, suburban neighborhood. He discovers that the family runs a business of abducting black bodies and selling them to the highest bidder, as we've just heard, like a modern day slave auction, and surgically removing most of their brains in order to transplant an ailing white person's brain inside or on top of what remains of their own. Well, the spirit or consciousness of the natural owners of these bodies has not completely disappeared. It is now mastered by the white personalities who not only colonize their bodies, but also control their will. However, as Jorge Bastos de Silva aptly puts it, quote, if the black man is to be possessed, the white man will be haunted, end quote. This haunting is expressed and get out as the failure of the surgery to completely hollow out the personhood of the black victim. In the film, the presence of the rightful natural owner of the body manages to resurface when stunned by a flash on the camera. I apologize for standing too close to the microphone. Therefore, black personhood is never fully exercised. On the contrary, it proves to be ultimately indelible. Both possessor and possessed coexist in an insoluble conflict. Unless awoken in a flash of light, the abducted and defiled black people are dispossessed of body and soul, becoming passengers or spectators in their own bodies, relegated to what the film envisions as the sunken place. The sunken place brings together what, e, what W.E.B. Du Bois termed a double consciousness, what Franz Fanon described as the lived interiority of a racial experience, that is, the systematic splitting of black subjectivity in societies that dehumanize blackness, and what George Yancey calls the white gaze, a violent historical process that shapes our sense of embodiment and imbues it with racial hierarchies. In Get Out the Sunken Place serves as a metaphor for the black experience of systemic racism and mental trauma that ensues from a long and consistent history of racial violence in America. While visualized simultaneously as a viewing or living room, complete with a television set and armchair, and as a pseudo space, a space without any physical features of light and gravity, the sunken place also reflects Chris's experiences of descending into a horrific sort of spectatorship, one that is devoid of any agency, but marks 
his only point of reference. It is from this point of view that he sees himself. <clears throat> Whoops. That he uh, sees himself continually moving farther and farther away, receding into the darkness where he becomes less and less in control of his own being. The screen remains his only link to the world, but he is clearly positioned through a series of high and low angle shots far below it. The images projected on this tiny tel television-like screen appear sepia-toned, likening them to low-quality color television, late-night infomercials, or sitcoms from the distant past. This small screen is chromatically contrasted to the cyan and deep space black that engulfs Chris. The sunken space offers us two opposing spectacles, an artificial, and if you can even see that, you can just see Chris, <laughs> okay, an artificial televisual framing of reality that exclusively features white personalities who manipulate and control their black audience by evoking would-be victims or viewers' most traumatic memories and triggering their deepest fears, and the other, an image of blackness that is characterized by absolute alienation from society, from others, and from oneself, and a radical displacement, a place of nothingness, of complete disempowerment. As a metaphor for the lived experience of blackness within hegemonically white societies, the sunken place, maybe this is more visible, <clears throat> has generated many productive discussions of racialized dispossession and desubjectification. But by focusing on contemporary racial politics, critics often overlook the role of the media in the, the media play in the framing of this non-space and with it the power of the televisual media to transmit messages, to hypnotize, and to remotely control viewers through the white gaze and all of the framing devices the Armitage family has at their disposal. Aided by audiovisual media, the white gaze is internalized, holding Chris's attention at the same time it withholds its own identity. This alien white perspective is rendered invisible because it is normalized as both real and authoritative. Yet the image of Chris in the sunken place reveals what he, what has been commonly understood as reality, <clears throat> that it is just another form of reality television. That is a reality that is subject and subjects us to programming. As Sarah Illett argues, Get Out is a film about screens, from the smiles, costumes, bodies, masks that people wear to the television screen that functions to engender passivity. Watching television is closely linked to Chris's childhood trauma. He blames his obsessive consumption of television for his failure to alert authorities that his mother was missing the night she was hit by a car and subsequently died. Rose's mother, Missy, capitalizes on this memory in order to hypnotize Chris and send him into the sunken place, where he is forced to live out this passive yet obsessive viewing practice. Peel clearly distinguishes the ghost effects of the photograph from television. Unlike the photograph that has the ability to seize one's likeness, taking and preserving a piece of one's spirit in the process, Television functions as an agent of dispossession. It does not trigger a memory, bringing ghosts back into the world. Rather, it seizes the viewer's attention, preying on their fears, hollowing out their personhood, and replacing their personality, their spirits, with others. In stark contrast to Poltergeist, where the malicious spirits of the dead reach out, of the, reach out to the most vulnerable member of the family, the five-year-old daughter, through the television set, or Ringu, where the murderous spirit of Sadaku uses the television as a portal to enact revenge on the living, and get out the television serves as a specter of white supremacy that feeds off the souls of black folks, silencing them and banishing them from the societal spectacle just as it casts them out of their own bodies. 
But as Samuel Weber explains, quote, television is different, not just from film, but also from what we generally mean by the word perception, end quote. Television has the ability to be in your living room and on some other scene at the same time. But as Weber points out, this confuses two experiences, the here and now and the being there. If television is both here and there at the same time, they can never be fully here nor entirely there. What it sets before us and in this television set is therefore a split or a separation that camouflages itself by taking on the form of a visible image. Get Out visualizes the uncanny ability of the television to be in the living room, a living room that ironically does not belong to Chris, while at the same time transporting him as a viewer to some radical elsewhere or nowhere. Chris is cast in limbo, floating in the void of a diminished existence. This is not only an issue of taking images out of context, but also one of screening, filtering, and controlling events, people, and the public in the form of images or the power of the gaze, a gaze that possesses us rather than the other way around. The result, as Weber sees it, is radically unsettling. Quote, the more the medium tends to unsettle, the more powerful it presents itself as the antidote to the disorder which it con contributes, end quote. What is so unsettling about Peel's critique of television and general role of spectatorship in an ideologically racist society is that in the act of watching, bodies become spectral, hollowed out presences. They are first appropriated by producers who like Missy and Get Out uses Chris's childhood trauma to install him in a narrative of her own making. Only once Chris succ succumbs to his assigned role can he then be purchased by the consumer. In the context of the film, John, Jim Hudson takes up the role of the consumer who buys Chris's body, his image, or more precisely, his artistic eye. However, in the process of consuming Chris's natural talent, as well as his body, Jim does not become Chris, nor does he even have to identify with Chris as a person, as would the spectator identify with a character in a film. Instead, Jim is intended to become a user or experiencer who impersonates or inhabits the space of Chris, as would a gamer or the creator of a deep fake. As such, he remains a spectator, albeit one who, is, who possesses command and control of Chris's body. Hence, Peel presents spectatorship both as parasitical, feeding off black bodies, and at the same time, haunted by them. The critique of televisual media for producing a docile or credulous public program to internalize and see itself through the lens of existing authority has a long and twisted genealogy that connects necromancy with what Achille Mbembe calls necropolitics. Building off of Michel Foucault's formulation of biopolitics, Mbembe examines how biopower affords the existing power structures an ex extra juridical right to kill that fundamentally operates on the logic of racism. Foucault describes the emergence of biopolitics as a shift from occurring in the 19th century from the exercise of discipline and power on the individual body to the exercise of power on life itself, a shift uh, from power exercised on humans as living entities to humans as a species. More importantly, at the core of biopower is a value judgment concerning who will live and who must die, resulting in the absolute control over life itself. For Foucault, the prime examples of biopolitics and action can be found in the final solution or the gulag archipelago. Mbembe instead argues that Nazism and Stalinism actually only amplified a series of already existent mechanisms of Western European social and political formations. Subjugation of the body, health regulations, social Darwinism, eugenics, meteorological theories on, hereditary, on heredity, 
degeneration, and race. Hence, necropolitics is more than the determination of who lives and who dies. It also presents us with a new category of power, a social existence that is in between life and death, what Mbembe calls a death world, in which vast populations are subjected to conditions of life conferring upon them the status of living dead. This power over life takes the form of possession. It is a power in which a person's humanity is dissolved to the point that their life can be said to be possessed by another, recalling the slave who, Mbembe argues, appears as the perfect figure of a shadow. The sunken place can also be seen as an expression of necropolitics, where Chris watches from a distance as his own body is made both operational and somehow fashionable, similar to a game skin for Jim's consumption and enjoyment. Like the slave who experiences a social death or death in life, Chris is kept alive in this state of injury, described by Mbembe as a phantom-like world of horrors and intense psychological cruelty. Yet this state of radical dispossession points to the underlying differences between self-possession as a fundamental right according to Western law and personhood, something that has become increasingly more unsettled. As Colin Dian explains, although the slave is dead in law, the law since Roman times presupposes the division between persons and things, requiring new taxonomies to be created for a person to be categorized as living dead. Hence, the creation of what she calls the negative person, who could be counted as a person if she needed to be held accountable for a crime, but not recognized as a self-possessing subject, nor a citizen who has any claim to legal or even human rights. And this is codified under US law having to do with the, the, the five tenths rule. Um, colonial and pre and pre-Civil War American economies that relied heavily on chattel slavery necessitated the emergence of this new type of person, both alive to be counted or accountable and dead in law, a person who is valuable but do, who does not possess value. While personhood has always been alienable, it can be taken by force in the form of slavery, fortified by debt in the form of indentured servitude, or given over to somebody by contract in the form of work for hire. Like possession, it is also radically unstable. In fact, the invention of the forensic person, as, a, as distinguished from the possessive individual, points to the fact that its tenuous relation to possession often produces such instability. If the person cannot be considered a discrete, autonomous entity, the possession of its body and soul are contested. One can see how the specter of personhood has helped to shape the discourse around prison labor, the detention of enemy combatants, the ongoing disputes over whether or when a fetus becomes a person, the legal status of the person who is placed under the law of, conservat of conservatorship, like Britney Spears, the status of the refugee, the migrant, the immigrant, the burial rights of the dead whose bodies can be possessed, but unlike the living, cannot be legally owned. The ex and I'm just going to wrap up now. The experience of the sunken place may resemble a troubled personhood, but the fact that po possessed victims do not completely disappear extends this troubled personhood beyond any legal discourse to what Brent Crossan calls the, quote, unsettled sovereignty of possession, end quote. Rather than read possession as a simple form of control, a zero-sum game, Crossan argues that spirit possession continues to challenge the concept of the possessive individual and of the Western selfhood by offering radical possibilities, co-presence, cohabitation of a body, ecstatic relations. While it is impossible to read slavery or the sunken place as anything but a radical form of dispossession, Contemporary media play an ambivalent role in the process of possession, in some cases commodifying human attention span, shaping people's desires, recrafting their symbolic world, 
blurring the distinction between reality and fiction, and even colonizing their unconscious minds. But in others, these spirits or ghost effects upset the distinction between personae and things, generating new modes of kinship. Thank you.